Proceed, Sir Linus, to procure my fall, and by the doom of death, end woes and all. Merchant of Syracuse, I plead no more. I am not partial to infringe our laws. The enmity and discord which of late sprung from the rancorous outrage of your duke to merchants, our well-dealing countrymen, who want and guild us to redeem their lives, have sealed his rigorous statutes with their bloods, excludes all pity from our threatening looks. It hath in solemn sign has been decreed both by the Syracusians and ourselves to admit no traffic to our adverse towns. Nay, more. If any born of Ephesus be seen at any Syracusian marts or fairs, again, if any Syracusian born come to the Bay of Ephesus, he dies. His goods confiscate to the Duke's dispose, unless a thousand marks be levied to quit the penalty and ransom him. Thy substance, valued at the highest rate, does not amount unto a hundred marks. Therefore, by law, thou art condemned to die. Yet this my comfort. When your words are done, my woes end likewise with the evening sun. Well, Syracusian, say in brief the cause, why thou departest from thy native home, and for what cause thou camest to Ephesus. A heavier task could not have been imposed than I to speak my griefs unspeakable. Yet, that the world may witness that my end was wrought by nature, not by vile offense. I'll utter what my sorrows give me leave. In Syracuse was I born, and wed unto a woman, happy but for me. And by me had not our hap been bad. With her I lived in joy. Our wealth increased by prosperous voyages I often made to Epidem, till my factor's death and the great care of goods at Brandon left drew me from kind embracements of my spouse, from whom my absence was not six months old before herself, almost at fainting, under the pleasing punishment that women bear, had made provision for her following me, and soon and safe arrived where I was. There had she not been long, but she became a joyful mother of two goodly sons, and, which was strange, the one so like the other as could not be distinguished but by names. That very hour, in the self same inn, a, a meaner woman was delivered of such a burden. Male twins, both alike, those for their parents were exceeding poor. I bought and brought up to attend my sons. <laughs> my wife, not meanly proud of two such boys, made daily motions for our home return. Unwilling, I agreed. Alas, too soon we came aboard. A league from Epidamnum had we sailed, before the always wind obeying deep gave any tragic instance of our harm, but longer did we not retain much hope. For what obscured light the heavens did grant did but convey into our fearful minds a dreadful warrant of immediate death. The sailors sought for safety by our boat and left the ship then sinking right to us. My wife, more careful for the ladder board, had fastened him unto a mighty mast. To him, one of the other twins was bound, whilst I had been like heedful of the other. The children, thus disposed, my wife and I, fixing our eyes on whom our care was fixed, fastened ourselves each to their own mast, and floating straight, obedient to the stream, was carried towards Corinth, as we thought. At length, the sun, gazing upon the earth, had dispersed those vapors that offended us. And, by the benefit of his wished light, the seas waxed calm. And we discovered two ships from far making a main to us. Of Corinth that, of Epidaurus this. But ere they came, oh, let me say no more. 
Gather the sequel by that wit before. Uh, nay, forward, old man. Do not break off so, for we may pity, though not pardon thee. Oh, had the gods done so, I had not now worthily termed them merciless to us. For ere the ships could meet by twice five leagues, we were encountered by a mighty rock, which being violently borne upon, our helpful ship was splitted in the midst, so that in this unjust divorce of us, fortune had left to the both of us alike what to delight in, what to sorrow for. Her part, poor soul, seeming as burdened with lesser weight, but not with lesser woe, was carried with more speed before the wind. And in our sight, they three were taken up by fishermen of Corinth, as we thought. At length, another ship had seized on us, and knowing whom it was their hap to save, gave healthful welcome to their shipwrecked guests, and would have wrapped the fishers of their prey had not their bark been very slow of sail, and therefore homeward did they bend their course. Thus have you heard me severed from my bliss, that by misfortunes was my life prolonged to tell sad stories of my own mishaps. And for the sake of them thou sorrowest for, do me the favor to dilate a full. What hath befallen of them in thee till now? My, my, my youngest boy, and yet my eldest care, at 18 years became inquisitive after his brother, and it importuned me that his attendant, so his case was like, wrapped of his brother but retained his name, might bear him company in the quest of him, whom whilst I labored a love to see. I hazarded the loss of whom I loved. Five summers have I spent it and furthest Greece, roaming clean through the bounds of Asia, and coasting homeward, came to Ephesus, hopeless yet to find, yet loath to leave on soft or that, or any place that harbors men. But here must end the story of my life, and happy were I in my timely death, could all my travels warrant me they live. Oh, hapless Aegean, whom the fates have marked to bear the extremity of dire mishap. Uh, now trust me, we're not against our laws, against my crown, my oath, my dignity, uh, which princes would they may not disannul. My soul would sue as advocate for thee. But though thou art a judge to the death, and past sentencing may not be recalled, but to our honor's great disparagement, I will favor thee in what I can. Therefore, merchant, I'll limit thee this day to seek thy life by beneficial help. Try all the friends thou hast in Ephesus. Beg thou, or borrow, to make up the sum and live. If no, then thou art doomed to die. Jailer, take him to thy custody. I will, my lord. Hopeless and helpless doth Aegean win, but to procrastinate his lifeless end. <laughs>
arrival here and not being able to buy out his life according to the statute of the town, dies at the weary sunset in the west. Stay there, Jovia, until I come to thee. Within this hour, it'll be dinner time. Till that, I'll view the manners of the town, peruse the traders, gaze upon the buildings, and then return and sleep within mine inn. With long travel, I'm stiff and weary. Get thee away. Many a man will take you at your word and go indeed, having so good a mean. Ah. A trusty villain, <laughs> that very often I'm dull with care and melancholy, lightens my humor with his merry jest. Well, will you walk with me about the town and then go to my inn and dine with me? I am invited, sir, to certain merchants whom I hope to make much benefit. I crave your pardon, but soon at five o'clock, please you, I'll meet with you upon the mart and afterwards consort you till bedtime. My present business calls me from you now. Well, farewell till then, and I'll go lose myself and wander up and down to view the city. Sir, I commend you to your own content. He that commands me to my own content, commands me to the thing that I cannot get. I to the world am like a drop of water that in the ocean seeks another drop, who falling there to find his fellow forth, unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself. So I, to find a mother and a brother in quest of them, unhappy, lose myself. Well, here comes the almanac of my true day. What now? How chance I'll return so soon? Return so soon? Rather approach too late. The capon burns, the pig falls from the spit, the clock just struck twelve upon the bell. My mistress has made a blood upon my cheek. She is so hot because the meat is cold. The meat is cold because you come not home. You come not home because you have no stomach, and you have no stomach having broke your fast. We that know it is to fast and pray are penitent for your default today. Stop in your wind, sir. Tell me this, I pray, where have you left the money that I gave you? Oh, ah. sixpence that I had on Wednesday last to pay the saddler from my mistress Gripper. The saddler answer, I kept it not. Well, I'm not the sport of humor now, and tell me, and valley not, where's the money? We being strangers here, how darest thou trust so great a charge from thine own custody? Pray you, sir, air as you sit at dinner. Your ma, like mine, should be your clock, and strike oh. you home without the oh. 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 Come, Romeo, come. These jests are out of season. Reserve them for the mere hour than this. And where have you left the gold that I gave you? To me, sir. Why, well, you gave no gold to me. Come on, sir knave. Have done with your foolishness, and tell me how I disposed the charge. My charge was to but fetch you home from the mart. Home to your house, sir, the phoenix to dinner. Stays for you. In what safe place have you bestowed my money? Or I shall break that merry sconce of yours that stands on tricks when I am disposed. Where is the thousand marks thou hast of me? Some marks of yours upon my pate, some of my mistress' marks upon my shoulders, but not a thousand marks between you both. I should pay your worship those again, perchance you will not bear them patiently. But thy mistress's marks, what mistress slave hast thou? Your worship's wife! What? Without flout me under my face, being forbid. There, take thou that, sir knave. What mean you, sir? God's sake, hold your hands! Nay, if you will not, I shall take my hands! Upon my life, by some device or other, the villain is o'er up with all my money. They say this town is full of cousinage, 
as nimble jugglers that deceive the eye, dark-looking sorcerers that change the mind, soul-killing witches that deform the body, disguised cheaters, prating mountebanks, and many such like liberties of sin. If it proves so, I'll be gone the sooner. Out in Centaur to seek this slave. I greatly fear my money is not safe. Whilst I at home starve for a merry look. That homely age, the 
glory beauty took from my poor cheek, that he hath wasted it. Are my discourses dull, barren my wit? If voluble and sharp discourse be marred, unkindness blunts it more than marble hard. Do their gay vestments his affections bait? That's not my fault, he's master of my state. What ruins are in me that can be found by him not ruined? Then he is the ground of my defeatures. My decayed fair, a sunny look of his would soon repair, but too unruly dear, he breaks the pale and feeds from home. Poor I am, but is stale. Self-harming jealousy, five beat his head. Unfeeling fools can with such wrongs dispense. I know his eye doth homage other wear, or else what lets it, but he would be here. Sister, you know he promised me a chain. With that alone, alone he would detain and keep fair quarter with his bed. Since that my beauty cannot please his eye, a weep would slept away, and weeping die. How many fond fools serve mad jealousy? The gold I gave Dromeo is laid up safe at the centaur, and the heedful slave is wandered forth and cared to seek me out by computation and mine host's report. I could not speak with Dromeo since first I sent him from the mark. See, here he comes. How now, sir? Is your merry humor altered? As you love strokes, so jest with me again. You know no centaur? You receive no gold? Your mistress sent to have me home for dinner. My house was at the Phoenix. Was thou mad that thou so madly thou didst answer me? What answer, sir? When spake I such a word? Even now, even here, not half an hour since. I did not see you since you sent me hence. Home to the centaur with the gold you gave me. The villain, thou didst deny the gold's receipt and told me of a mistress at a dinner for, for which I hope you felt I was displeased. I am pleased to see you in this merry vein, sir. What means this jest? I pray you, master, tell me. Yeah. Thou jeer and flout me in the teeth. Thinkest thou I jest? There, take thou that ah! and that. Oh, fool, sir! I think now your jest is in earnest. But what bargain do you give it me? Because that I sometimes do familiarly use you for my fool and chat with you, your sauciness would jest upon my love and make a common of my serious hours. When the sun shines, let foolish gnats make sport, but creep in crannies when he hides his beams. If you would jest with me, Know my aspect, and fashion your demeanor to my looks, or I will beat this method into your scots. Scots call you it, so you would leave battering, I'd rather have a head. But I pray you, master, why am I beaten? What dost thou not know? Nothing, sir, but that I am beaten. Well, shall I tell you why? Aye, sir, wherefore? For they say every why hath a wherefore. <laughs> well, why, first, for flouting me, wherefore, for urging it the second time to me. Was there ever any man thus beaten out of season when in the why and the wherefore is neither rhyme nor reason? Well, sir, I thank you. Well, thank me, sir, for what? Mary, sir, for this something you gave me for nothing. Oh, well, I'll make you amends next to give you nothing for something. But uh, say, sir, is it dinner time? No, sir. I think meat wants that I have. In good time, sir, what's that? Basting. Well, sir, this will be tried. If it be, sir, I pray you eat none of it. Your reason? Lest it make you choleric and purchase me another dry feasting. Well, sir, learn to jest in good time. There's a time for all things. <laughs> but stop. Who walks this yonder? I, I, Antipholus, look strange and frown. Some other mistress hath thy sweet aspects. I am not Adriana, nor thy wife. The time was once when thou unurged wouldst thou that never words were music to thine ear, that never object pleasing in thine eye, that never touch well welcome to thy hand, that never meat sweet savored in thy taste, unless I spake or looked or touched or carved to thee. How comes it now, my husband? Oh, how comes it that thou art thus estranged from thyself? Thyself I call it being strange to me that undividable, incorporate, and better than my dear self's better part. Ah, oh, do not tear thyself away from me. For no, my love, as easy mayest thou fall a drop of water in the breaking gulf, and take unmingled that same drop again without addition or diminishing, as take from me thyself and not me too. <laughs> Dearly would it touch me to the quick, just thou would hear I were licentious, and that this body, consecrate to thee, by ruffian love should be contaminant. Wouldst thou not spit at me, and spurn at me, and hurl the name of husband in my face, and tear the stained skin off my harlot brow, and cut from my false hand the wedding ring, and break it with a decent divorcing vow? 
Don't do it. I'll uh, entertain the offered fallacy. Romeo, go bid the servants and friends for dinner. Oh, I beat. I cross me for a sinner. Oh, oh, this is the fairy land. Oh, spite of spite. We talk of goblins, owls, and sprites. We obey the thought that it was good soon. They'll suck our breath.
your parchment the blows you gave were in. Your own handwriting would tell you what I think. I think. Thou art mask. Mary, so it doth appear. Let the wrongs I suffer and the blows I bear. I should kick me kicked. And being at that pass, you would keep up my heels and be aware of that. Yeah! 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 You say I sing your Balthazar. Pray God our cheer may answer my goodwill and your good welcome here. Oh, I hold your dainties cheap, sir. And you're welcome, dear. Oh, Signor Balthazar, either at flesh or fish, a table full of welcome makes scarce one dainty dish. Oh, good meat, sir, is common. That every churl affords. And good welcome more common, for that's nothing but words. Oh, small cheer. A great welcome makes a merry feast. I, to a miserly host and more sparing guest. Though my capes be mean, take them in good part. Better cheer you may have, but not with better heart. <laughs> but soft, my door is locked. Go, bid them let us in. Bond, Bridget! Marion, Cecil, Jillian, Jin! Mo, Mulhorse, Capen, Crump, Crump, Idiot, Pass! Either get thee from the door or sit down in the hatch. Wilt thou ponder for women when thou callest for such store? When one is one too many, go get you from the door! Poor Pat has made our quarter. My master stays in the street! Let him walk from whence he came, lest he catch cold on his feet! <laughs> Doubt not, sir, 
but she will well excuse why at this time the doors are made against you. <laughs> Be ruled by me. Depart in patience and let us to the tiger all uh, together. Uh, and about evening, come yourself alone to know the reason of this strange restraint. If by strong hand you offer to break in, now in the sterling passage of the day, a vulgar comment will be made of it, yes. and suppose so by the common route against your yet ungold estimation that may with foul intrusion enter in and put a book of grave unto a pen. For slander lives upon succession, forever house when it gets possession. Oh, you have prevailed. I will depart from quiet, and in despite of mirth, mean to be merry. Ah. I know a wench of excellent discourse, pretty and witty, wild, and yet too gentle. There will we die. This woman that I mean, my wife, but I protest without desert, hath oftentimes upbraided me withal. To her will be to dinner. Catch you home, and catch the chain. By now I hope tis made, and bring it, I pray you, to the porpentine. For there's the house. And that chain will I bestow for nothing but to spite my wife upon mine hostess there. Good sir, make haste, for mine own doors refuse to entertain me. I'll knock elsewhere and see if they'll disdain me. So I'll meet you at that place some hour hence. Do so. This jest shall cost me some expense. <laughs> <laughs> Mistress, what thy name is else I know not, nor by what wonder you do hit of mine. Less than your knowledge and your grace, you show not than I first wonder. More than earth divine, teach me, dear creature, how to think and speak. Lay open to my earthy gross conceit, smothered in errors, feeble, shadow, and weak, the folded meaning of thy words to see. Are you a god? <laughs> Would you create me new? Transform me then, and to your power I'll yield. But if that I am I, then well I know your weeping sister is no wife of mine, nor to her bed no homage do I owe, but far more, far more to you do I define. <laughs> Sing, Simon, for thyself and I will go spread over the silver waves my golden hairs, and as a bed I'll take them in their line. In that glorious supposition, think he gains by death the best such means to die. Let love be light. Be drowned as you sink. <laughs> To wink, sweet love, is look on night. Why call you me, love? Call my sister so. Thy sister, sister. Yeah, that's my sister. No, it is thyself, mine own self's better part, my eyes, clear eye, my dear heart's dearer heart. Well, all that's my sister is, or else should be. Call thyself sister, sweet, for I am thee. Thee will I love, and with thee live my life. For thou hast no husband, yet not a wife. Give me thy hand. Oh, stop, sir. Hold you still. Thou 
art, Romeo. Thou art my man. Thou art thyself. I am an ass. And I'm a woman's man besides myself. What woman's man? Well, besides thyself. Besides thyself. Mary, sir, besides myself, I am due to a woman. One who claims me. One who haunts me. One that will have me. What claim lay she to thee? I married, sir, such claims that you would lay to your horse, and she would have me as a beast. And not that I being a beast she would have me, but that she being a very beastly creature lays claim to me. Well, what is she? A very reverent body. Oh. I, sir, such a one as a man may not speak of without he say, sir, reverence. Uh, I have but lean luck in the match, and yet she is a wondrous fat marriage. How does that mean a fat marriage? Married, sir. Kitchen witch and all grease. And I know not what use to put her to but to make a lamp of her and run from her by her own light. I warrant the poor rats in the tallow in them would burn a hole in winter. If she lives until doomsday, she'll burn a week longer than the whole world. <laughs> what complexion is she of? A sword, like my shoe, but her face nothing half so clean kept. For why? She sweats. Making a hole in her shoes in the grime of it. <laughs> well, that's about the water woman. No, sir. Tis ingrained. No one's blood could not do it. <laughs> What's her name? No, sir. But her name is three quarters. That's an L. And three quarters. Will not measure her from hip to hip. <laughs> Did she wear some bread? No more from head to foot than from hip to hip. She is. Miracle. <laughs> what a globe! I can find out countries in her. In what part of her body stands Ireland? Mary, sir, in her buttocks. I found it out by the bogs. Where? Scotland. I found it by the barrenness hard in the palm of her hand. Where? France. I found it in her forehead, armed and reverted, waging war against her hair. Where? England. I looked for the chalky cliffs, but could find no whiteness in them. But I guess it stood in her chin by the salt room that ran between France and it. Where's Spain? Faith, I saw it not, but I felt it hot in her breath. Where? America, the Indies. Oh, sir. Upon her nose, all or embellished with rubies, carbuncles, and sapphires, declining their rich aspects to the hot breath of Spain, who sent whole armadas of carrots to be ballast at her nose. Where stood Belgia, the Netherlands? Oh, sir, it did not look so low. <laughs> Do conclude that this drudge or diviner laid claim to me, called me Dromeo, swore I was a sword to her, told me what pretty marks I have about me. Such as the mark on my shoulder, the mole on my neck, the great wart on my left arm, that I, amazed, ran from her as a witch. And I believe that if my breast had not been made of faith and my heart of steel, she would have transformed me into a curdled dog and made me turn at the wheel. Oh. <gasps> go hide thee presently, host to the road. If the wind go any way from shore, I will not harbor in this town tonight. If any bark put forth, go to the mart, where I will walk till thou return to me. If everyone knows us and we know none, tis time, I think, to trudge Pack and be gone! This from a bear, a man would run for life. So fly I from her that would be my wife. Mm. Oh, Lord. <laughs> There's none but witches to inhabit here. And therefore, tis high time that I were hence. She that doth call me husband, even for my soul, doth for a wife a poor. Oh. But her fair sister, possessed with such gentle and sovereign grace and in such Enchanting presence and discourse has almost made me traitor to myself. But, lest I be guilty to self wrong, I'll stop my ears to the mermaid's song. Master and that boy! Alright, that's my name. I know well, sir. Look. Here is the chain. I thought to attain the department time, but the chain being unfinished made me say that long. What is your will that I shall do with this? <laughs> what please yourself, sir, I made it for you. Uh, made it for me? No, I have spoken not. Uh, not once, not twice, but 20 times you have. Now take it home with you. Please your wife with all, and soon. At supper time, I'll visit you and receive my money for the chain. I, I pray you, sir, receive the money now. For fear you never see the chain nor money more. Ah, uh, you are a married man, sir. Fare you well. <laughs> what I should think of this, I cannot tell. Well, but uh, this I think. There is no man is so vain as to refuse such a fairly offered chain. 
I see men here need not live by shifts, when in the street they need such golden gifts. Out to the mart, and therefore Dromeo stayed. They finished the put out, then straight away. And this brings us to intermission, and so to let you know a little bit about the UNCW Theater Department, we're going to show a brief video about what we do here and um, see if it's of interest to everyone watching. UNCW Theater is where raw actors can come to be molded. These are some of the best teachers I've actually had in my life. Immediately, I was given opportunities to become a professional. Here is where theater is born. The main strength that we have in our department is that we offer students three concentrations within the major. First concentration we have is in performance. We have plays that are going to be funny and are going to be interesting and are going to be wild and wacky, but at their core, you're watching people learn and express themselves. Before this, I had no idea any of the general aspects of creating a character for yourself within a play. We're lucky to have a wonderful performance studio, big space with lots of light, as well as a black box studio. I like the main stage because it's big enough without being too big, so it also gives like that feeling of intimacy. My favorite spot is probably the black box. That's where I've taken all my acting classes and where I've really felt like I've made progress and all my experiences here. The second concentration we have is in design and technology. It's really amazing that the students get to do so much work on the actual productions and everything. I've worked on every single show since I've joined the department. Being able to do carpentry in a scene shop like the one we have here is really nice. There's a lot of wonderful equipment that's available for us to be taught how to use and we're trusted to learn how to use it properly. And then the third track we call the customized track. If you're choosing customized, you're basically creating your own agenda. There's so much more to theater than just acting. There's the technical side and there's administration side and the performance side and I just want to try a little bit of everything. Custom's more suited to forming your own curriculum. It's just any kind of combination that you want where you can pick and choose what you want to get out of being a theater major. A student that shows focus and interest and commitment can be given opportunities that you might not otherwise get as a student until grad school. We're really united as a faculty in what we want out of our students and what we want out of the program and what we want the students to achieve as a result of it. When I was looking at schools, I saw that the professors at this university were involved outside of school, not only as professors, but also doing projects themselves within the industry. All of our faculty are working professionals, so they bring what they're doing out in the profession now into the classrooms. What we're teaching in the class, what we're asking of our students, is being asked of ourselves. Since I've been teaching here, I've been lucky enough to work on seven feature films and about 15 television shows. The more I go out and direct and act, the better teacher I am. The more I teach, the better actor and director that I am. Just the ability to go and knock on a professor's door and just say, hey, I'm looking for a monologue on this, or I just want to check in with you, that's something that's really helpful. Every student in the department to graduate has to go through a senior seminar class. And basically the purpose of the class is to get us prepared for pursuing a career after college. It was definitely helpful in kind of preparing us financially for kind of what our situation is going to be as actors. It's never going to be an easy road to success. But really a lot of what we do is giving them the confidence and the skill set to know they're always going to be able to put food on the table, they're always going to be able to pay their bills, and they're going to be successful. I think when I look back, I will appreciate that I had this safe space to really learn and make mistakes and fail and try things. This is where I learned how to fully embrace my art, my way of expression, like who I am as a whole. 
you can't reach your highest potential unless you have an absolute support system. We just have that here. And thank you once again. And uh, as stated in the video at UNCW, we love uh, campus visitors and we're very proud of our program. So feel free to get in touch if you have any further questions. And there will be information about the program and links on the YouTube page. Thank you so much. And we're about to start part two of William Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. Sir, and then she bears away. Our fraudage, sir, I can pay afford. I brought the oil, the 
balsam oak, the aqua vitae, the ship is in her trim, the merry wind blows fair from land, and she stays for naught but her owner, master, and yourself. Oh, oh, oh. oh now, a madman. Oh, thou peevish sheep. What bark on the damn which stays for me? A uh, ship you sent me to to hire a rope oh, I sent thou for a rope, and told thou for the purpose and what end. You sent me to a rope in the city. You sent me to the bay to hire a bark. I will debate this matter at more leisure and teach your ears to list to me with more heed. To Adriana, villain, hide thee straight. Give her this key and tell her in the first covered oar with Turkish tapestry there sits a purse of ducats. Bid her send it. Tell her I am arrested in the street and that shall bail me. Hide thee, slave, be gone. On, officer, to prison till it come. <gasps> Adriana! That is where we dined. Where Dalzabel did claim marriage with me. She is too big, I fear, for me to cope in. It's a... Oh, thither I must, although against my will, for servants must their masters' minds fulfill. Ah, oh, Luciana, did he tempt thee so? Might thou perceive austerely in his eye that he did plead in earnest? Yea or no? Look to your red or pale or sad or merrily. What observation canst thou make in this case of his heart's meteors tilting in his face? Well, first he denied you had him no right. Well, he meant he did mean none. The more might spite. Then swore he that he was a stranger here. And true he swore, yet so forsworn he were. And then pleaded I for you. And what said he? That love I begged for you, he begged of me. With what persuasion did he tempt thy love? With words that in an honest suit might move. Others who did praise my beauty and then my speech. To speak him fair, a patience I beseech. I cannot, nor I will not hold me still. My tongue, though not my heart, shall have his will. He is deformed, crooked, old, and seer. Ill face, worse body, shapeless everywhere. Vicious, ungentle, foolish, blunt, unkind. Stigmatical in making, worse in mind. Why would be jealous then of such a one? No evil lust is wailed when it is gone. Oh, but I think him better than I say. And would hear in that other's eye it were worse. Far from her nets, the lapwing cries away. My heart prays for him, though my tongue do curse. Go! The death, the purse, the sweet, make haste, go! How hast thou lost thy breath? Why burn where is thy master, Dromeo? Is he well? No, nope. he's in tartar limbo, worse than hell. The devil in an everlasting garment hath him, one whose hard heart is buttoned up with steel. A fiend, a fury, pitiless and rough, a wolf, nay worse, a fellow all in buff, a back friend, a shoulder clock, or one who got Why, man, what is the matter? I do not know the matter. He is rested on the cape. What, is he arrested? Tell me in whose suit. I know not in whose suit he is arrested. Well, but he's in a suit of buff that rests in it. That I can tell. We have sent him, mistress. Redemption. The money in his desk. Go fetch it, sister. This I wonder at, that he, unknown to me, should be in debt. Tell me, was he arrested on a band? No, on a stronger thing. A chain. A chain. Do you not hear it ring? What, the chain? No, the bell. His time was gone. It was too where I left him and now the clock strikes a blade. Go, Dromia. There's the money. Bear it straight and fetch my master home immediately. Come, sister. I am pressed down with conceit. Conceit my comfort and my injury. Oh. There is not a man I meet with a salute me as if I were the well-acquainted friend. Everyone does call me by my name. Some tend to me money, some invite me, some other offer me thanks for kindnesses, some offer me commodities to buy me. Even now a tailor called me into his shop and showed me silks he had bought for me, and therewithal took measure of my body. Sure, these are but imaginary wiles and laughing sorcerers inhabit here. Master, here's the gold you sent me for. Oh, what? Have you got the picture of old Adam new apparel? What gold is this? What Adam does thou mean? It's not the Adam that keeps the paradise, but the Adam that keeps the prison. The he that goes in the skin for the prodigal. The he that came behind you, sir, like an evil angel, and bid you forsake your liberty. What thou makes an officer? Nice, sir, the sergeant of the band. He that brings any man to break him. He that brings any man to answer the prison. 
that man, he that all things may going dead, says, God give ye good rest. Well, sir, there rest in your foolery. Are there any ships put forth tonight? May we be gone? For a step part in them, or know that the bark expedition set forth tonight. And then were you hindered by the sergeant to tarry for the holy delay, and here are the angels that you sent forth to deliver you. The fellow is distracted, so am I. And here we wander in illusions. Some blessed power deliver us from hence. <laughs> Man, I will 
not break away. I'll give thee, ere I leave thee, so much money to warrant thee as I am rested for. My wife is in a wayward mood today. She will not likely trust the messenger that I should be attached in Ephesus. I tell you, twill sound harshly in her ears. Huh, here comes my man. I think he brings the money. How now, sir, have you what I sent you for? Here's that! I warned you will pay them all! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Where's the money? Why, sir, I gave the money for the rope! Five hundred ducats, villain, for a robe? We'll serve you five hundred, sir, at that rate. To what end did I bid thee hide thee home? To ropes and sir, and to that end I have returned. And to that end, sir, I welcome you. Yeah! <laughs> it, sir, be patient. Uh, and I just
Are these your customers? Did this companion with the saffron face feast and revel it at my house today, whilst upon me the guilty doors were shut, and I denied to enter in my house? Oh, husband, God doth know you dined at home. Where would you have remained until this time, free from these slanders and this open shame? Dine at home? Thou villain, what sayest thou? Sir, sooth to say, you did not dine at home. No. Were not my doors shut up and I locked up? Purdy, your doors were locked and you shut up. And did not she herself revile me there? Dance, Mabel. She herself reviled you there. And did not her kitchen maid rail, taunt, and scorn me? Certainly she did. The kitchen must have scorned you. And did I not enraged depart from thence? Verity you did. My bones bear witness. It is no shame the fellow finds his vein, and yielding to him humors well his frenzy. Thou hast suborned the goldsmith to arrest me. Alas, I sent you money to redeem you by Dromeo here, who came oh, haste for it. Money by me! Not in goodwill you might, sir, but not a rag of money. Went not thou to her for a purse of ducats? He came to me, and I delivered it. And I witnessed with her that she did. God is the rope maker, bear me witness that I was sent for nothing but a rope! Mistress, that the man and master is possessed. I oh! know it's by their pale and deathly looks. They must be bound and laid in a dark room. Oh, oh say, wherefore didst thou lock me forth today? And why did you deny the bad gold? I did not, gentle husband, lock me forth. And I, gentle master, has ain't no gold. I confess we were locked up. Dissembling villain, thou speakst false and both. Dissembling harlot, thou art false enough. <gasps> and our confederate with a damned pack yes. to make a loathsome, abject scorn of me. But with these nails, I'll pluck out the false eyes that would behold me in such a shameful sport. Stay here tonight for all the town, and therefore away to get our stuff aboard. 
I am sorry, sir, that I have hindered you, but I protest he had me the chain, but most dishonestly he left the knife. How some man stands here in the city? Very reverend reputation, sir, of credit infinite, highly beloved, second to none that lives here in the city. Oh, speak softly, yonder as a sick box. If so, and that self chained about his neck, which he forswore most monstrously to have, good sir, draw near to me. I'll speak to him. Senor Antipolis! I wonder much that you would put me to this shame and trouble, and not without some scandal to yourself. A circumstance that old self to deny this chain which now you wear so openly, besides the charge, the shame, imprisonment. You have done wrong today, oh. my most honest friend, who but staying on our controversy and hoisted sail and put the sea today. This chain you had of me, can you deny it? I think I did. I never did deny it. Yes! Sir, that you did, and for sport too. Who heard me to deny it or forswear it? These ears of mine, that no sit here, see? Fie on thee, Fletch. Tis pity that thou lives to walk where any honest man was off. <laughs> thou art a villain to impeach me thus. Oh. I'll prove mine honor and mine honesty against thee presently, if thou darest stand. I dare, and don't defy thee for a feeling. <laughs> Disturbed would 
mad or man or beast. The consequences then, thy jealous fits, have scared thy husband from the use of wit. <gasps> She never reprehended him but mildly when he demeaned himself rough and rude and wildly. Why bear you these rebukes and answer not? She did betray me to my own reproof. Good people, enter and lay hold on him. Now, not a creature enters in my house. And let your servants bring my husband forth. Neither. He took this place for sanctuary, oh. and it shall privilege him from your hands till I have brought him to his wits again, or lose my labor in assaying it. I will attend my husband, be his nurse, diet his sickness, for it is my office, and will have no attorney but myself, and therefore let me have him home with me. <gasps> be patient, <gasps> for I will not let him stir, till I have used the approved means I have, with wholesome syrups, drugs, and holy prayers, to make of him a formal man. It is a branch and parcel of mine oath, a charitable duty of mine order. Therefore, depart and leave him here with me. I will not hence and leave my husband here, and ill it doth beseem your holiness to separate the husband and the wife. Be quiet and depart. Thou shalt not have him. Do the duke of these indignities. Come, go. I will fall prostrate at his feet and ne'er rise till my tears and prayers have won his grace to come in person hither and take perforce my husband from the abbess. Anon, the duke himself in person makes his way to this melancholy lay, a place of death and sorry execution of the Pombal court. To see our reverend Sir Cousin Merchant to put unluckily into this bay against the laws and statutes of this town executed publicly for this offense. We we'll see where they come. We'll behold his death. Kneel unto the Duke. Yet again, proclaim it publicly. If any friend should pay the sum for him, he shall not die. So much we tender him. Justice, most gracious Duke, against the abbess. She's a virtuous and, and a reverend lady. <laughs> it cannot be that she hath done thee wrong. May it please your grace. Antipholus, my husband, whom I made lord of me and all I had of your important letters. This ill day, a most outrageous fit of madness took him that desperately he hurried through the streets. With him his bondmen, all mad as he, doing displeasure to the citizens by rushing in their houses, bearing fence rings, jewels, anything his rage did like. Once did I get him bound and sent him home, whilst to take order for the wrongs I went that here and there his fury hath committed. Anon, I would not by what parade escape he broke from those that had the guard of him, and with his mad attendant and himself met with us again, madly bent on us, chased us away till raising of more aid, we came again to bind them. Then they fled into this abbey, whither we pursued them. And here the abbess shuts the gates on us, and will not suffer us to fetch him out, nor send him forth, that we may bear him hence. Therefore, most gracious duke, with thy command, let him be brought forth and borne hence for help. Long since thy husband has served me in my wars, and I to thee engage a prince's word, when thou didst take him as the master to thy bed to do him all the good and grace I could. Go, knock at the abbey gate, and bid the lady abbess come. I will determine this before I start. Oh, grant me justice. 
justice, even for the service that long since I did thee, when I bestrid thee in the wars and took deep scars to save thy life, even for the blood that I then lost for thee, now grant me justice. Unless the fear of death doth make me dote, I see my son Antipholus and Romeo. Justice, sweet prince, against this woman there. Oh. She who now gave us to me to be my wife, who hath abused and dishonored me even in the strength and height of injury. Beyond imagination are the wrongs that she this day hath shameless thrown upon me. If discover how, thou shalt find me just. This day, great duke, she shut the doors upon me while she with harlots feasted in my house. A grievous fault, say woman, Didst thou so? No, my good lord. Myself, he and my sister today did dine together. So befall my soul, as it is false, he burdens me with all. Now may I look on day nor sleep at night, but she tells to your highness the simple truth. No, oh, perjured woman, <laughs> they are both for sure. Oh. In this, the oh. madman justly yeah. charged them. Oh. My liege, I am advised in what I say. Neither disturbed with the effect of wine, nor had he rash. Provoked with raging ire, albeit <laughs> my wrongs might make one wiser mad. This woman hath locked me forth this day from dinner. And this goldsmith, were he not packed with her, could witness it. For he was with me then, who parted with me to fetch a chain, promising to bring it to the porpentine, where Balthazar and I did dine together. Our dinner done, and he not coming hither, I went to seek him. And in the street I met him, and in his company was this gentleman. There, that perjured goldsmith did swear me down that I of him this day received a chain, which God he knows I saw not, for the which they did arrest me with an officer. I did obey, and sent my peasant for certain ducats. He with none returned. Then, fairly, I bespoke the officer to go in person with me to my house. By the way, we met my wife, her sister, and a rabble more of vile confederates. And along with them, they brought one pinch. A hungry, lean-faced villain, a mere anatomy, a mountebank, a threadbare juggler and a fortune teller, a living dead man. This pernicious slave, forsooth, took on him as a conjurer. Gazing in mine eye and, and feeling my pulse, he cried out, I was possessed. Oh. Then, all together, they fell upon me, bound me, bore me from thence, and in some dark and dankish vault at home, there left me and my man, both bound together, till not with my teeth, my bonds in sunder, I gained my freedom and ran immediately hither to your grace, whom I beseech to give me ample satisfaction for these deep shame and great indignities. My lord, in truth, thus far I witnessed with him, and he died not at home, but was locked out. But had he such a chain of thee, or no? My lord, he had, and when he ran in here, these people saw the chain about his neck. And besides, I will be sworn these ears of mine heard you confess you had the chain of him after your first false word on the mark. And thereupon I challenged you, and you fled into this abbey here yeah, from thence. I think you are come by miracle. I never came within these abbey walls, <laughs> and nor ever didst thou challenge oh, me. Oh. It is false, you burden me with all. Why, what an intricate impeach is this? I think you've all drunk of Circe's cup. Oh. If there he was housed, there he would have been. If he were mad, he would not plead so coldly. Mm. You say he dined at home. The goldsmith here denies that saying. Azira, uh, what say you? And sir, he saw it. From my finger snatched that ring! Tis true, my liege, this ring I had of her. You saw us now he met her at the abbey. As sure, my liege, as I do see your place. Why, this is strange. Go, call the lady abbess. I think you all made it a stark man. Uh, most mighty do. Vouchsafe uh, me speak a word. H happily I see a friend will save my life and pay the sum that may deliver me. Speak freely, Syracusian, what thou wilt. Is not your name, sir, called Antipholus? And is that not your bondman, Dromeo? Within this hour I was his bondman, sir, but he, I thank you, not in due, my gorge. Now my Dromeo and his man unbound. 
I am sure you, uh, both of you, remember me. Ourselves we do remember by you, sir, for lately we were as bound as you are now. You are not one of Pinch's patients, are you, sir? Why you look strange on me? Uh, you know me well. I never saw this man before in my life. Oh, grief hath changed me since you saw me last. And careful hours with time's deformed hand hath written strange the features in my face. But tell, tell me yet, does thou not know my voice? Neither. Dromio, nor thou. No, sir, nor I. I am sure thou dost. I, and I am sure I do not. And whatsoever a man denies, you are now bound to believe him. Not know my voice, O oh, time's extremity. Has thou so cracked and split in my poor tongue in seven short years that here my only son knows not my feeble key of untuned cares? Though now this graded face of mine be hid in sap consuming winter's drizzled snow and all the conduits of my blood froze up, yet hath my night of life some memory, my wasting lamp some fading glimmer left, my dull deaf ears a little used to hear all these old witnesses. I cannot err. Tell me, thou art my son Antipolis. I never saw my father in my life. But seven years since, in Syracuse, a boy, thou knowest we parted. But perhaps, my son, thou shamest to acknowledge me in misery. The Duke and all who know me in this city can witness with me that it is not so. I never saw Syracuse in my life. I tell thee, Syracusean, twenty years have I been patron to Antipolis, during which time he ne'er saw Syracuse. I see thy age and danger make thee dote. Ask mighty duke, behold a man much wrong. Oh, I have been two husbands, or mine eyes deceive me. One of these men is genius to the other. And as of these, which one the natural man? Which one the spirit? Who deciphers them? Die, sir, Romeo, command him away. Die, Aegean thou art not, or else his ghost? My old master, who hath bound him here? Whoever hath bound him, I will loose his bonds and gain a husband by his liberty. <laughs> Speak, old Aegean, if thou beest the man that had a wife once called Amelia, that bore thee at a burden, two fair sons. Oh, if thou beest the same Aegean, speak. And speak unto that same Amelia. If I dream not, thou art Amelia. If thou art she, tell me, where is that son that floated with thee on that fatal raft? By men of Epidamna, he and I and the twin, Dromeo, were all taken up. But by and by, rude fishermen of Corinth by force took Dromeo and my son from them. And me they left those of Epidamna. But then he came with them, I cannot tell, I to this fortune that you see me in. Why, here begins his morning story right. These two Antipholuses, these two so alike, and these two Dromeo, one in semblance. Besides her urging of her wreck at sea, these are the parents to these children who are accidentally oh. met together. Oh. Antipholus, thou came in from Corinth first? Uh, no, sir, not I. I came from Syracuse. Uh, stay, stand apart. I know not which is which. Uh, came I from Corinth, my most gracious lord. Uh, and I with him. Brought to this city by that most famous warrior, Duke Menaphon, your most renowned uncle. Which of you two did dine with me today? I, gentle mistress. And are you not my husband? No, I say nay to that. And so do I. <laughs> she did call me so. And her fair sister here, this gentlewoman, did call me brother. What I told you then, I... Hope I shall have leisure to make good oh. if this be not a dream. And you for this chain had me arrested. I think I had, sir. I deny it not. I sent you money, sir, to be your bail. By Dromeo, but I think he brought it not. <laughs> Oh, I must have the clink from you. There, take it. 
And much thanks for my good cheer. <laughs> Renowned Duke, vouchsafe to take the pains to go with us into the abbey here and hear at large discourse all our fortunes and all that are assembled in this place that by this sympathized one day's error have suffered wrong. Go and keep us company and we shall make full satisfaction. Thirty-three years have I but gone in travail of you. My son, until this present hour, my heavy burden may be delivered. The Duke, my husband, and my children both, and you, the calendars of their nativity, go to a gossip's feast and go with me after so long grief, such festivity. Uh, with all my heart, I shall gossip at this feast. joining us for our first live stream from UNCW with Comedy of Errors. A few things to note, uh, the design team was set designed by Rand Enlow, who is our resident set designer. We had a guest lighting designer, Rachel Levy, who came all the way from Chicago and has been lucky enough to win an Emmy for So You Think You Can Dance. Uh, we have the musicians, uh, Adrian Varnum and Bob Russell. Adrian helped compose and compile the music. The costumes were by Mark Sorensen. And of note, all the spaces that you see in the frame right now were designed by students. So here at UNCW, students do have opportunities to design as part of their design and production curriculum. And it's a bit unusual. We think it's a pretty special program. So please check us out. Uh, always free to come for a visit, and you can certainly email us, contact us, and we will arrange for you to come out and see the campus and see more shows. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, and hope there will be more next year. Thank you. <laughs>